This is the Owens Recovery Science Podcast. Welcome back to another Owens Recovery Science Podcast. This is Johnny Owens, Kyle Kimbrell. We have a very special guest today. I'm going to reveal in a minute, but Kyle, long time no talk. How are you doing, man? I'm, I'm good. I'm good. It's, it's good to be back on here. I'm excited for today. This will be a fun little chat. I know, man. Hey, Johnny, um, how was, um, you were, you were on a, like a, like a three week vacation recently. You how just, do I look? Do I, I look, I look like a, a bronze hand. You bought one of those amazing weird, weird French there, didn't Riviera. You? I did. I did. <laughs> I did. So yeah, I was working over in Europe for a little bit. I might've swung down to the South of France and oh. Yeah, man. Yeah. They, so do they, what's the delicacy down there? I know when you go to, I just had a call with some people in Canada today and I was like, look, y'all, I can't, I can't eat poutine at lunch. Cause that's, that's, that's all they have up there is poutine. Yeah. But what do they have in the South of France? Amazingness, dude. Um, Rosé all day. I'll tell you oh, that. Oh, yeah, okay. baby. And that's uh, like a college girl's Instagram post. Rose all day. <laughs> I was doing it. I don't care. I do not care. Um, Where are those IG lives? I thought we were going to get some IG lives of Johnny. Oh, I showed Rose you that video. I tried to record and I just couldn't take it. <laughs> so it was yeah. over, man. So yeah, man. Well, it was great. Um, well, I'm glad great you had catching up everybody time. there <laughs> had a good time at a conference and uh, you know I, I I'll tell anyone this if you're going to south of France or France or anywhere leave your teenage daughter at home <laughs> that's that's basically <laughs> all I can say so <laughs> I found every McDonald's <laughs> in France because my damn teenage daughter <laughs> couldn't handle anything there so so that's basically it but but yeah, man, long time to talk. So lots of courses. I got extreme reward injuries next month. Yeah. Um, I know you guys, you got the USC um, labs coming up. Coming up, yep. We got the new paper that just came out, two papers in Frontiers, uh, sarcopenia yeah. paper, the heart failure paper. And if you if you use the Delphi unit, the new Delphi units, baby, they got the new Look lithium out. battery. Colleen answering no more battery questions yeah, the rest of yeah. his career. No more battery issues. So that's <laughs> that's beautiful. So if if you if you use Delphi, they do have a lithium battery that finally goes in this thing, and it's and it's awesome. So it's good. Ten hours, I think ten hours of continuous use. They said, dude, the one I teach with. I mean, I always turn it on. It's still like fifty percent. You know, days later. So that's pretty nice. sweet. Nice, yeah, that's nice. So you know, I I, I love to tell a, a good yarn. Like you know, tell a good story. A yarn, a yarn is that a yarn like a story? Is that is that like a Lubbock, Texas thing? A yarn? Come on, no, it's just an old guy thing, you know. So I, <laughs> I like to tell the tales, man. I tell good stories. And sometimes, you know, I might have to. There's some international kind of flair I have to add into this. Oh, you know, like yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I need an English accent, maybe a Scottish accent. Yeah, you know, Russian, whatever accent. You know, there's only one accent I can do. Uh, that's it. My daughters, everyone's told me. I know that it's like, not Spanish. I know you. It's Australian. I can oh, only Australian. do an Australian accent. Oh, oh. Yeah. So, you know, hello. Ooh, this is. It, that's not a knife. <laughs> this is a knife. And so I swear to God, that's the only accent I can do. So that's why today's podcast oh. is very relevant. Greatest segue ever. You're going to hear ever. a true that's Australian That's a poor version of it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, it is not a full version of it. What was that voice? <laughs> <laughs> oh my Did the God. dingo eat your baby? So, oh, I love that. <laughs> anyways, let's get in more serious here. I have my really good friend, Adrian Sexton on. So I've known Adrian since, what was it, Adrian? 2014. He came to the Center for the Intrepid. Um, so he's, he's my brother from down under. Um, had worked with trauma amputees, traumatic brain injuries. And um, Adrian, you made it to, to visit us at our base. Was that through a grant or was that, how did you do that? Yeah, it was through a, a scholarship from the Epworth Hospital where I work. Uh, it, you can apply for you know, scholarships for research or for further education. And, and Alison and I, we applied for one for a, a study tour of the military rehab centers in the U.S., uh, looking at amputee rehab primarily, 
I, yeah, that's where we met. Yeah, so way back when, you know, so during the wars, Allison and Adrian came and visited us center for the Intrepid, and it was super cool. They got to kind of to hang out with us, and we were just sharing back and forth what they're doing, what, what we're doing, um, explaining why American football is much better than rugby. Um, hey, I agree. I don't, I'm not rugby. Rules. It's Aussie rules football, thanks. Oh, Aussie rules. It's even worse, man. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, we, we became um, good friends after that. And we were, we were really just kind of getting deep into BFR at our base at that point and uh, started showing them new things that we were doing for, for, for combat casualty care. And one of the things we showed them was BFR. And then Adrian took it back to uh, Australia and he's at Epworth. He's a physiologist there and, and he is really a, an expert in trauma and amputee care. But also I think what's relevant, what we want to talk about a lot today is traumatic brain injury, concussions, um, how you handle those types of folks? Because I've been getting multiple emails here recently with athletes with with these type of injuries, and also is there a role for BFR in this? And so he's done a, a lot of work in that space. He's presented in conferences about what he's seen using BFR with concussions or TBI. And so, anyways, without further ado, my my friend Adrian Sexton, what's up, brother? Not a great deal, guys. Thanks for having me on. And Johnny, I think you better work on the Aussie accent there, please. <laughs> Damn it. So now I got no accents. Just no. a bad yeah, West probably Texas. Not. <laughs> Look, you went from sort of Australian to English and then uh, in between again. <laughs> That's a problem, man. They all sound the same to me. I'm sorry. Hey, I agree. I just, I just butcher it. So, man, Adrian, tell us a little bit about your background. Um, I know you grew up on a farm. I grew up yeah. on in a cotton field in West Texas. My dad was a mechanic, and so I couldn't handle busting my knuckles. So I went to college and became a learned man. Um, so, what about you, man? Same similar story, Johnny. I yeah grew up on a farm in New South Wales, country Australian, little town called Finley, on a rice farm and a sheep farm. And again, yeah, apart from riding motorbikes and going hunting and stuff with friends there was nothing about farming that I was really <laughs> that took a shine to and I wasn't very good at it so again <laughs> I went I, I took the city boy path went to uni and studied exercise science and then exercise physiology and then based on that um, made my way into the field here at, at the Epworth Hospital um, where I work in as you mentioned, trauma rehab, so multi-trauma, so orthopedic rehab, amputees, and then I guess the predominant area that I'm working at the moment would be around concussion rehab and sort of been doing that since probably 2018, really, when it was started uh, the their concussion clinic, which is a big multi-D clinic. Um, so, yeah, probably I would say 60 to 70% of my current involvement now is is with the concussion cohort. So I guess kind of fill us in a little bit and, and everyone, so we start to, to kind of build this story here. There's concussion, there's TBI, there's PTSD, you know, there's all these different types of things. So, you know, I, I think the biggest questions we get and, and what people mostly see, you know, are out of the wars is, is this kind of sports concussion. So can you kind of lay the groundwork of, of what you see there from mild to severe and, and what all the, the, the kind of wording is behind these different, these different diagnoses. Yeah, sure. So I guess at Epworth, we have multiple clinics where we have a, a, a more severe traumatic brain injury unit, the ABI unit as well, um, and the concussion rehab clinic as well. So the two they was staffed by the same doctors and similar staff across both, but they had two distinct uh, clinics where the concussion clinic, as you said, a lot of the sporting concussions um, will come through to us, whether it's professionals, uh, high school, college level, but also we get a lot of uh, road trauma and workplace concussions as well. So we get a lot of um, uh, compensable, we call it, through TAC, which is the Transport Accident Commission, and VWA, Victorian uh, Work Cover Authority. So it, it's not just sports related. It is, um, you know, everyday trauma related as well uh, from a concussion point of view as well that we are treating. 
So let's say you get a mild or moderate concussion or just you got an athlete. Okay, they, they've had a concussive experience. If they walk in your clinic, what, what are you guys doing to, you know, kind of like these are the objective things we're looking at. Those are the diagnostic criteria we're looking at and, and this is the plan forward. So generally they will get referred through to us, through to our doctors via their local general practitioner. Once they come through to us, if they, if we, if our doctors see them within the first two weeks, essentially they just get set, get sent away, go home, keep doing what you're doing as long as you're not exacerbating your symptoms. It's post two weeks after that concussive event. If they're still symptomatic, that's when they will come back through to us in, into our clinic because the majority of concussions will resolve within seven to 14 days. It's the ones that go beyond that seven to 14 days, which is known as post-concussion syndrome or, or prolonged concussive symptoms. That's where um, the patients will need our input essentially because those symptoms, the brain function hasn't restored you know, in that set time frame where it normally should. So it needs um, sort of specialist care essentially. To help what are those? That. What are those first two week symptoms? You typically you're gonna send them home and say you're gonna deal with this. Yeah, well, I mean, such such a a broad range of symptoms with concussion, and no two patients are really that similar. But the most common symptoms that we see are headache, dizziness, um, sleep disturbance, uh, cervical dysfunction, so neck pain, discomfort vestibular issues, so dizziness on head movement, um, and emotional issues such as um, anxiety, depression. Yeah, they're, they're like such a real broad range of symptoms, but they would definitely be the main ones that we see. So basically, I'm 51. That's like my symptoms every day of my life. I'm yeah, maybe you need to be checked for concussion. <laughs> it's been going on for like seven to 10 years. So yeah, I might need to be checked out. So, okay. And sorry, so, the, the other big one is uh, vestibular, uh, visual ocular as well. So the vision and control of the eyes. And so you send them home, you say, these are the things you're going to expect. But if in two weeks or so, these are still ongoing, then we need to potentially put you into the program. That's right. So the only, the patients that uh, myself and the other clinicians work with, they're the ones that haven't recovered within the two weeks. If they're recovered in the two weeks, we never meet them. They just meet our doctors and none of us ever. So it's when it's prolonged beyond that two-week period, that's when they'll come into our program. They'll be assessed by a physiotherapist, a neuropsychologist, and an exercise physiologist, which is me. So the physiotherapist will be assessing uh, vestibular function, visual function, uh, working on their cervical range of motion function, the neuropsychologist, obviously looking at their cognition, sleep, uh, emotional issues, and the exercise physiologist, uh, myself, I will assess them for what's known as uh, autonomic dysfunction or exertional issues. So when the patients exercise, their symptoms come on. And that's based on a few things, which I'll, I'll go on into uh, when you guys are ready. Well, I think we're ready on that because it's, Autonomic dysfunction, I think, was the driver. So I, during the wars, the TBIs, they were the, the number one thing that was handled. And it was like all hands off until we understand this autonomic dysfunction. Because you guys understand what exposure they can handle with exercise. You know, obviously, we're looking at BFR. That's, a, that's kind of potentially a low load, big exposure. And so it kind of took over everything. So, so what is that autonomic dysfunction really, where does it come from and what does it mean? Yeah. So, and to just to go back to a question you asked a bit earlier, what would be the difference between the more traumatic, the more severe TBI versus concussion? Well, the simple answer is uh, severe TBI. If you do a CT MRI, there's going to be some injury to the brain concussion. You will do a CT scan nothing will show up because there's, there's not, it's not a structural issue. It's a functional issue. It's how the brain is functioning that becomes um, impaired, not so much the structures of the brain. Huh. 
Okay. Um, so with regards to the autonomic dysfunction, if we think of the autonomic nervous system, you've got your sympathetic and parasympathetic. The sympathetic will increase heart rate, blood pressure, respiration rate, and that's what's known as um, creating the fight or flight response. And the parasympathetic does the contrary to that. So it will decrease heart rate, blood pressure, uh, reduce respiration is the rest and digest response. So post concussion, that system can become impaired. And a real large driver of that is the barrow reflex, which is a mechanism to control blood flow in and out of the brain. Uh, post and it's an autonomic nervous system mediated function. So post concussion, we can see that that mechanism doesn't work appropriately. So either too much or not enough um, blood enters the brain, which can cause those somatic symptoms. So headache, dizziness, shortness of breath, nausea, increase, or a fluctuating heart rate, fluctuating blood pressure as, as well. Um, and while that occurs, then if you think about the brain perfusion, so once blood enters the brain, it is directed to where it needs to be to allow the brain to function appropriately. So for instance, people listening to the podcast, areas of the brain important for concentrating and taking in information will be getting more blood past the brain responsible for, say, running or lifting weights gets far less. So again, that, that neurovascular mechanism can become impaired as well. So we're either getting not enough or too much blood into the brain, and then once it's getting into the brain, it's not ending up where it needs to be. So the person goes to read or concentrate and all these symptoms come on. The person goes to exercise, all these symptoms come on as well, all those somatic symptoms. So it's a real energy crisis. So you think about a mu you're trying to work a muscle, you're not getting a blood supply to the muscle, it's going to fatigue and bomb out quickly, as we know with BFR. Similar thing with the brain. That, that's, what's, um, yeah, that, that's what's occurring, essentially, to drive a lot of those symptoms. And that's where myself as an exercise physiologist would come in to really treat those symptoms. So what would be your plan of care then? Um, that second week they're, you know, they're still having symptoms, all the, all these kind of episodes yeah. you're talking about. Yeah. So essentially what we do and John Letty and the team at the university of Buffalo, they, they're really sort of leading the way with this, um, yeah, exercise-based concussion rehab. So they've developed what's called the Buffalo Concussion Treadmill Test, which is a graded exertion test. So the idea is the patient walks on the treadmill, the incline goes up gradually. As the incline's going up, their heart rate's going to go up, their blood pressure's going to go up. So if we've got dysfunction to that barrier reflex, then as the heart rate increases, we're going to get an increase in blood flow to the brain, and we're going to trigger those symptoms. So generally with the treadmill test, a three-point increase in symptoms. So say they start you know, one out of 10, they get up to a four out of 10, that's symptom threshold. You would cut the test off there. And 80 to 90% of whatever heart rate they achieve, that's what we exercise at. So that's known as um, sub-symptom threshold because exercising at the sub-symptom threshold uh, should not trigger... A significant rise in symptoms, but it will also challenge the autonomic nervous system regarding the barrier reflex neurovascular unit to function appropriately. And then in a graded manner, so every week or, or as indicated by the patient's response to their symptoms, you would increase the heart rate intensity, increase exercise intensity, bring it up, bring it up, bring it up until they're exercising greater than 85% 90% of their heart rate max with minimal or nil symptoms. So it's like a graded, basically you're, you're feeling like you can reset the system through this graded kind of program. What would, what would that protocol be then? So you're on the treadmill, it's intervals, it's just steady state walking. What do you guys do? It's, it's so the treadmill set at 5.3 kilometers per hour. No idea what that is in miles per hour for you. Uh, guys. Freaking metric system. I mean, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so whatever 5.3 kilometers per hour uh, translate to in miles, it's, that's it, that's the speed. Call it half. Yeah. yeah. Call right. it half. I just yeah, take three, everything three in half. Yeah, yeah it, that, that'll do. So <laughs> the, the speed doesn't change. The speed of the treadmill will not change. Each minute, essentially each minute, 
you will put about one percent uh, gradient incline increase. Okay. And you just keep doing that until those symptoms come out. If the symptoms don't come out, then essentially they don't have any autonomic or exertional symptoms, and it's something else. It might be more vestibular, might be more visual, cervical, um, emotional. Um, but the idea of that test is to really draw out if it is exertional symptoms. Then, as we said, set the heart rate for exercise at a sub-symptom le level and progress from there as we can. Do you see any of these folks like bonk, like they're on that program and all of a sudden the symptoms hit and it just goes like really, really south or is it just kind of subtle? It's general. Oh, yeah. No, we get massive increases in symptoms. Like, it, 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 again, it can be varied. The way they respond to exercise can be varied. Uh, for, for instance, some patients, they might start symptoms two out of ten and they might just slowly, slowly increase as the gradient increases. Whereas some, they might start with symptoms that are a bit higher, let's say a four out of 10 already, they might be a minute in and their symptoms are up at an eight. So it, it can be gradual and it can be really instant as well. Crazy. Okay. And yeah. so some, some kind of like RPE scale or something, Adrian, and they're yes. kind of giving you a, a grade. Yeah. So, okay. so we, we monitor them. We have a heart rate monitor on them. We take blood pressure, and if you're skilled enough to take blood, exercising blood pressure, you can take that throughout. Um, use a 0 to 10 VAS scale for symptoms and the 6 to 20 Borg RPE scale okay. as well. Yeah. Got it. So we get quite a few measures because, yeah. if, as I mentioned, if the autonomic nervous system's not functioning correctly, then their heart rate might be bouncing around. So you often see that their, their heart rate's 110 20 seconds later, it's 100, then it's 105, then it's 115. Mm -hmm. So obviously we can't use heart rate as their, their limiting factor. We can't say measure, work, yeah. work at that because it's, it's not reliable for them. So we would then go to the RPE scale. Okay, you, you bombed out at 15. So work it around a 12. Okay. That makes it kind of challenging to figure out progressions of things, I would imagine. If you can't trust heart rate, then you, at some point, you get to where you subjective. can't trust it, or you got to trust subjective, or... Yep, subjective, yeah. yeah, unfortunately. And then thing thing is with these, with the test anyway, we're getting them to report their symptoms. So it's still subjective anyway. So yeah. getting them to exercise, you know, based on their own... Um, thoughts on how they're going with regards to their RPE and symptoms, it, it, it works. But the idea with the exercise is we're trying to improve those autonomic functions. So hopefully within a few weeks, we can use heart rate because the heart rate is no longer bouncing around. It becomes more stable. So then we can switch them on to, okay, this heart rate, this is what I want you to work at. If you're going all right, add 10 beats to it the next time you yeah. go for a walk or ride the exercise bike or whatever. Yeah. Is that what you're feeling is typically weeks? You tell the patients, like, we're hoping in weeks we're switching to this heart rate kind of monitoring aspect? Hopefully, if they're really diligent with their exercise, surely within four weeks okay. that, that will improve, yeah, yeah. And, and, I, and I this generally, a, Go ahead, man. You, we generally see our patients fortnightly, so hopefully, you know, in the two weeks' time, which fortnight, I just remember the first time I said fortnight to you guys, you thought I was talking about the video game. The video game, and yeah. So, <laughs> no so idea. So two weekly. So <laughs> fortnight means two weeks. We're waiting for you or to break out in some weird dance. The video game or Abraham Lincoln, I think both have used the term, so. Well, well, I'm talking about two weeks here. So we see him every two weeks. So hopefully within two weeks uh, we can progress there their rate of exertion, whether it's based on an RPE, based on their heart rate, and their heart rate's more responsive. But is this more of a, you send them home, whether this is a walking program or treadmill program, or are they coming in and you need to see them constantly? Initially, it would be just a walking program. The idea is to progress the intensity. Um, but if they've got an exercise bike as well, that's great. You use the exercise bike. Because the thing with walking, you've got head movement. So it could be a visual issue. It could be a vestibular issue that then compounds how they actually can function with it because their head's moving. But on an exercise bike, stable head position, you can really just target that rate of exertion right. or that heart yeah. rate. Yeah. Okay. But yes, 
aerobic exercise is, is the starting point. Okay. So, I, you know, my old intern, Sean Suttles, he was our traumatic brain injury kind of expert in the DOD in our area, at least. We had a sharing mechanism with the NFL where he was supposed to go there and help share what we're learning on TBI and they were sharing back. It, it didn't really work so well. And there's a little, <laughs> I could, over beers, I'll tell you why. But, um, you know, when they ran into the visual component, they were using like these Nike Sparks walls. I don't know if you ever saw those before. So they had all these, you know, they're putting these like goggles on, trying to help these guys learn vestibular, not vestibular, um, you know, different visual fields. Yeah, yeah. So what are you guys, that's what I was going to ask. What are you guys doing for the visual? So, uh, so I've just held up to the screen for Johnny to see. We've got these um, uh, vestibular goggles that we can use to assist assess vestibular dysfunction and visual dysfunction but also to treat it so the physios use them i've never actually used it there's quite a new piece of equipment um so do you mind sharing what that equipment is or uh, i can i don't know what it's actually called though <laughs> oh okay okay yeah, yeah it looks cool it looks like the metaverse yeah yeah no i'm not sure I don't know what the actual brand or the name of this piece of equipment is, but I can can I can let you guys know. You can chuck it in the podcast notes if you like. Okay, perfect. Okay. So we use that. We but mostly the physiotherapist will just be doing things like the VOMS, the visual ocular motor screen, yeah, um, hall pike, to, to, and all those assessments to assess the vestibular function. We also have a vision coach as well, which might be similar to what you just mentioned the night thing, but. It, things light yeah. up and you've got to track it. And yeah. Touch it. You're touching. Yeah. It was a giant wall and you're touching. Moving yeah. Around on it. Yeah. So, okay. so we have that as well. So we use that, that, but the majority of the stuff I'm doing is all around aerobic and then resistance exercise. And the physios generally will address all the visual vestibular stuff. What scales do you guys use to rate their severity? Uh, uh, from symptoms or RPE? Well, onset. So the TBI comes in, you're you're measuring something, I would assume. What do you guys use over there? So we got the post-concussion symptom checklist. Okay. That's that's probably the, one of the first ones we use. It rates from um, uh, mild to moderate, uh, mild to severe symptoms in broken down into different uh, components as well. So we, we the doctors will screen them with that on their first visit. Okay. And then we can use that going forward. They're, they're the main scales we use. We use the dizziness handicap inventory, the headache di disability index, the neck disability index, and I think that's it for the, the questionnaires. They're the majority of the ones we would use. Okay. And then yeah. once you've had a TBI, always at risk for a worse TBI or, or another TBI down the road? That's the thing, you know, do you have a subtle brain all of a sudden? Uh, sorry, Johnny, what was that? It just cut it out of it. Well, you know, are you at a higher risk once you've had a TBI that you could have more TBIs down the road? Oh, so it really depends on who you listen to on that. Some researchers and professors in the area say that if you've had one concussion or multiple concussions, you'll be more susceptible to further concussions down the track. And even so generally the amount of force required to give you a concussive event is um, uh, greater than 70 Gs of force. So some researchers even say the more concussions you have, that number will come down as well. Whereas you might have a knock to the head, 50 G of force, you get concussed with that as well. But then on the other side of the coin, uh, there's doctors and um researchers and, and Cameron Marshall, I think he's a Canadian guy who's really big in the space of concussion rehab and he does a podcast as well. It's really interesting. But he says that if let's say you've you've had six concussions but you've only had one each year and all your symptoms have resolved before you have the next one, then he says well potentially there's no reason why why you should be more susceptible or at greater risk of more severe symptoms or more prolonged symptoms if you've recovered. But I think the key is how you recover after each yeah. one. So if you've had six concussions and if you recovered really quickly and no issues, then potentially you won't have any problems with um, ongoing 
head knocks, like you might recover just as well. But on the other side of that, if each time your symptoms took longer and were more severe to recover from, then you're probably tracking down the path that each time you are concussed, you will have a longer recovery, you'll have more severe symptoms. So it could go either way. It, it, as I said, there's conflicting um, opinions based on that out there. Yeah, I think the dogma here is like once you had it, you're always just more susceptible, you know, yeah. be it that's the evidence or not. But I remember we had a young Marine who he had all these notches on the helmet. He took a picture, I didn't see his helmet, but every time he kind of blacked out, he would put a little notch on his, you know, and he was downrange, so he didn't get time to recover. He just had to kind of rally up and get back out downrange and go do it. But um, yeah, you know. that's where the issues are. If you haven't recovered from, if you get a subsequent knock before you've recovered, that's where the issues are. That's when you're likely to have you know, symptoms exacerbated and prolonged recovery. And then you come into the whole CTE you know, um, discussion yeah. as well, which is obviously big in, in American football, but also in, in Australian football at the moment as well. So what do you guys consider recovered? Uh, recovered? For me, before I would send someone back to return to play, they will do what's called the Goodman Gapsky test or the um, Chicago Blackhawks test. It's a test that they put together to clear the ice hockey players going back to play. So it's a test that has a high level of exertion on a spin bike on a bike. So you will do um, you do a steady build, then you'll do hard intervals and stop dead hard interval stop dead, you know, trying to see if there's any post-exercise hypertension. Mm -hmm. It is then like lateral bounding across hurdles, burpees with your head, eyes following where your hands go, jump, rotation. So we're challenging the heart rate so to get a really high heart rate with the efforts on the bike. We're challenging the cervical with all the postural change with things like burpees. We're challenging the visual and vestibular system uh, with all the jump rotations, burpees, and things like that. So if you can get through that and you have zero symptoms at the start and you have zero symptoms throughout and at the end, that's recovered. And that's when we would say, okay, you can go back to contact training and return to play. Is it black and white? If they have, a, they're like, yeah, I feel a little dizzy, but I don't have my headache or whatever. Yes, black and white generally, especially. Okay. If we're talking so about a sporting person, then yes, we definitely don't want any symptoms. Like if, if it comes on a little bit, sorry, that's a fail. I guess where it, you, you might say there could be some gray area. If you've got um, someone that's exercising and they're doing all this high level exertion, non-contact, of course, no issues at all, but then they go to uni or something. And when they start to read and concentrate, then they get some symptoms that's when we might go, okay, so it's not so much related to the exertions, more from a cognitive point of view, uh, and we'll have the discussion with our doctors. If we do this test, they get through the test, but they've still got symptoms with reading um, or concentrating. Uh, are we clearing them for return to play? And are you measuring heart rate during that time? I mean, it's, it's yeah. everywhere, but, but you're still measuring that. So you have yeah, yeah. some objective and then subjective. Huh. Yeah, I, you wish, want to ensure, I wish we had black and white ACL return to plays like that. Yeah, yeah, it'd make it a lot easier, wouldn't it? <laughs> it yeah. It's essentially with the heart rate, we want to ensure they're getting up definitely above 85% of their heart rate max with nil symptoms, because that means think of 85% of your heart rate max, high heart rate, high blood pressure probably associated with that. We're challenging the baroreflex, all those baroreceptors in the neurovascular unit. Um, to maintain stable blood flow because your organs shouldn't have a uh, change in blood pressure or blood flow. They don't, they don't need that. And it's yeah. not like a working skeletal muscle. So um, if, you're, if we can't ensure that they're not getting too much flow into the brain, um, then we don't want to be clearing them to return to you know, high-level exertion or, or sporting events. So these recalcitrant, I don't know if I said that right, kind of cases, those are the three emails, you know, I've had in the last few weeks. Um, 
you know, what do you do with these ones that they just not get in better? I mean, is there a, a thought? Yeah, it can be really tricky. Essentially, look, ideally, everyone follows this nice graded pathway and they improve, they get back, they can go to sport, but that's simply just not the case. And whether it's and whether that's you know, psychological issues impacting on the, how they're going, or it's the vestibular cervical, or, or it is the exertion. For the ones that just are really slow, we just from and look from a physical sense, what I do with them, I just pair them right back, take them right back from and make a very very simple exercise program, and try and increase it at a slower rate that I normally would with someone else. So you've just got to, it's just time. And, I, and unfortunately, as well, for some of our concussion patients, we discharge them and they aren't symptom free. Yeah. yeah. They still have they still have residual symptoms. And but for those ones, it's more about teaching them or helping them manage those symptoms to be able to live with the symptoms better. So for instance, one patient, you know, let's say their symptoms are always a five out of ten, headache and dizziness. From the start, when I first saw them, they weren't doing anything. They were you know, just housebound, didn't leave the house. If we can get progress them that they go back to work, they're going, they're exercising, but those symptoms are still a five out of 10, then that's all right because they've still shown um, massive improvements. That's, that, improvement. that's still, yeah. still a really good outcome. How important is the psychological component? Do you guys have that piece? Yeah, so at, in our clinic here, we have, the doctors, we have exercise physiologists, we have physiotherapists, we have neuropsychologists, we have clinical psychologists, occupational therapists, and social workers. So nice. we address concussion from every angle it needs to be addressed. So generally where concussion rehab falls over or fails is you've got a physio just doing vestibular or exertional um, things or you've just sent someone to a psychologist or a psychiatrist and they're just doing the emotional side of things but it's when you address the physical the emotional social work the return to work all those components that's when you're going to get the best result yeah multi-d man that's where we saw Absolutely. it as well i mean we were being yeah. driven by when these with these and almost all of them seem to have some sort of tbi you know if they were in an ied blast but yeah, it was, it was every component was super important. I mean, we felt like we were at the bottom until we could finally start to grade them up. And I, I wasn't nearly as scientific as you were for sure with this. I probably blasted these people too much. For sure. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, that's what we don't want to do. Like, we all got headaches. Come on, yeah. let's go. Hey, hey this, this was the military. They wouldn't have expect any less, hey? <laughs> yeah, I know, unfortunately. So. Yeah. Let's roll into, okay, you came, you saw a BFR with us over the CFI back in 2014 or whatever it was. Um, and, you know, again, I got pushback from our TBI clinics that, you know, this is, tell us about what BFR is, where like it does this thing. It's very similar to heavy lifting. You get this kind of large metabolic response, yada, yada, yada. They're like, yeah, we don't, we not sure about this. It's going to set these people off. So what are your kind of views on this as you've been using it over there with your people? Well, the first person I ever used um, BFR on was a TBI patient, like a, a severe TBI patient as well. But the same issues you had, Johnny, uh, do you know, I think I emailed you a lot over that time was with the same ones we're getting here. There's just pushback. It's like, okay, we're including people. Like how, how is this going to impact from an order? Heart rate's going up, up, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah heart rate, blood pressure, like we're getting, we're stimulating the exercise press and reflex. So we're going to get an increase in these, these sympathetic, sympathetic output. Um, so from my point of view, I guess to just go back to how we even get started with BFR was just putting all these, the research out there, all the thing, all those safety um, articles and papers that were done, looking at the relative safety, but then also putting on the papers saying, look at all that benefits so it seems safe we're getting really good benefits essentially it was like let's just try it with this guy and 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 the patient we did try it on he so severe tbi like he um uh, he was in um, pta i think for night to post-traumatic amnesia for 96 days uh but he was 12 wow. years down 
12 years down the track, though. So the doctors didn't have any concerns about cerebrovascular integrity or intracranial pressure or any of those things. But he had real residual weakness. He, his, his calf raise on the leg press, and again, we're in kilos here, it was 10 kilos. So very, very weak. So if he, his ankle strength is 10 kilos when your ankle gives you 60% of your forward propulsion, it's really going to limit his mobility. Uh, so and he and he that tried. was that was disuse weakness, or is there some other mechanism? With no, it's just the neurological, just neurological. Those those um, neurological pathways weren't weren't intact. So he, he, okay. he, his motor unit recruitment was poor. Like he, he was just was not not getting much activation of that that muscle at all. Mm. So his and he was young. He's, he's he was he was in his twenties when he was injured. Um, he was 34, I think, when we started doing uh, BFR. He wants to run, wants to, you know, young guy, go to the gym, do all the things that young people want to do. So he'd had extensive therapy, so extensive rehab at Epworth. Uh, gym memberships paid for by TAC, the Transport Accident Commission, just to try and improve his strength. He even went on a trial of uh, anabolic steroids to improve his strength. And, and none of it what? worked. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, so it's um, a, a lower dose than you'd see down in the old meathead gym getting handed out under the table. But uh, yeah, it's still a prescribed dose of, of steroids. Like we need a disclaimer here for our listeners that this is not an okay thing to try to fake yeah. to your doctor to get them to prescribe you a low dose of That's right. steroids. You want to you get it? Do, in the US. do not do that. <laughs> <laughs> that's but wild even, though i've never even heard of that either. yeah hey and, and but the thing is kyle like it it was unsuccessful like he, it didn't improve yeah. his strength so they said all right look bfr it, it surely can't hurt him he's 12 years down the track he's it's not like he's got bleeds on the brain or anything like that so let's do it so we trialed it and we trialed it you know with crude equipment and it's not the delphi pts or anything like that mm -hmm. but his his calf strength uh, went up 250 percent bilaterally wow his mobility, what was your protocol so he we did the 80 percent limb occlusion pressure 30 15 15 15 30 second rest the standard sort of bfr protocol he yeah. was doing uh Total gym calf raise, single leg, total gym squat. And I also got him bouncing on a trampoline, like a mini trampoline, to work on that power in his ankle joint. They're the three exercises we started with initially. Massive increase in his strength. Mobility didn't show significant, but trended upwards. And we've just kept going from there. So I, I still see him probably three times a year for 12 weeks of BFR. And what we find is like his quad strength, his calf strength, like he, he started at 10, as I said, his gastro, when he comes back in for retesting, he's sort of around probably 40 kilos. By the time we finish each bout of BFR, he goes up to more around 60, 65. So, so he improves, but then when we aren't doing BFR anymore, it, it seems to drop back. And that's probably just because, you know, he, he, that motor unit recruitment is not going to improve. He's not going to be, recruit muscles that he hasn't got an intact connection to. So while he's doing BFR, we're able to do low load exercise and really get the most out of his available motor units and the muscle fibers he's, he's um, activating. Improves his strength, improves his mobility, but then going on, you know, his, his calves are only around 60 kilos still. So, you know, he weighs more than that. So it's not even his body weight. Yeah. So, finds it really difficult then to go into the gym and maintain that output. So he just drops off a little bit and then we just hit him again with it and just we're hopefully trying to continue to step up so he can get to a point where he can, can run or at least get himself into the gym where he can then maintain it ongoing. How, how and tolerance cool. was fine. He was okay. No issues at all. No, no issues yeah. at all. He loved it because for 12 years, he, he felt like he couldn't push himself. He couldn't exercise like no matter what he did, he didn't, you know, he didn't get the burn. Yeah. 
So he so loved that's, it. That's kind of what I was curious about, Adrian, is like how – I mean, how quickly did you sort of get the sense that, hey, this this BFR thing that we're trying is, is actually – doing something advantageous for him it sounds like maybe first exposure yeah well I've, exactly after his first exposure he rings me okay. like it, the next day and because i've never had i haven't had muscle soreness in 12 years yeah. you get that a lot yeah and so he loved it absolutely loved it and it's the same with the concussion guys if which I'll sort of go into their activity levels a little bit if, if you want. But if, if yeah. once you can make them feel like they're exercising, especially if they're, yeah. you know, of the younger cohort, they'll, they'll love it. And they'll go, this is definitely something I want to do. With the concussion, are you, so, I mean, like if we're using BFR to rehab a musculoskeletal injury, I mean, the typical kind of progression is we, we sort of use BFR as this way to get us to, bridge lifting heavy um is is it similar with concussion would you would you use it in that same manner or, or i could, I'm, in my head i'm thinking well maybe i get up somebody to a point where that heart rate increases kind of linear at this point it's not jumping around they get to a point where they can walk for however long at that at, you know a, a given incline and then maybe i add be a part of that um or are you going about that in a different manner? Yeah, well, let, let's go into that now. Let's let's chat a bit about exactly exactly what I do with these concussion guys. Cool. So before I do, I guess one of the other things that really you know led me to think, okay, I think BFR is going to be advantageous for this group, is that when we just think about activity reduction, so Post, post-concussion, our patients' activity levels can decrease up to 90% or more, and that's just based on, based on their symptoms. So if they're really symptomatic, simply walking to the fridge, hopping out of a chair, then they'll just limit their activity a lot. Yep. And what we know from... from you got two days, here, baby. You got two that's days. That's right. That's exactly it. So, you know... If we go, you know, five to 14 days, we're really peaking in our, our muscle protein breakdown. You know, I think what seven, was it day seven, you'll lose 1.5 kilos or 3.1 pounds of muscle. And, and that can take, you know, that's that's 12 weeks in the gym to put that on. Seven days, we've lost it. Yep. Our muscle protein synthesis can decrease, you know, up to 30%. So anabolic resistance, as again, as we teach in the course, so the body becomes resistant to synthesizing protein, it becomes more likely that it's going to break protein down. And even if we start loading appropriately, that anabolic resistance, that can just continue. Even if we start to get an appropriate load on, there's no guarantees that we're going to overcome that. Uh, So these patients, they're going to be losing muscle size. They're going to be losing um, muscle strength. And that's, not just associated with disuse, so so lower limb cast immobilization or lower limb injury. It's just activity reduction as well. I think it was the the, the shard study that yeah, had ninety percent. Yeah. yeah, the walking study. So 90 percent reduction in steps over thirty days, and they were getting this again large uh, increase in protein breakdown, uh, muscle protein synthesis was dropping right off uh, and it wasn't just you know it was quite systemic as well so muscles becoming less sensitive to insulin so less glucose uptake less atp production liver less um, sensitive to glucose so less glycogenesis so it's a real negative cycle and if and and, and what i'm re- referring to these aren't even concussion studies but we see this with concussion our patients activity levels are dropping way down so they are going to experience this as well and then if you get the you know, further decondition you get then that has a bigger impact on your autonomic nervous system so we can really drive things like orthostatic intolerance so whether that's orthostatic hypertension so blood pressure drop on stand or orthostatic tachycardia so a racing heart rate on stand if or postural change so if these patients are 
becoming deconditioned because their autonomic nervous system isn't functioning correctly, by them being inactive, it's just going to make things worse and really compound it. So if we think about our concussion cohorts, like, and a lot of the time, the, the target heart rate is less than 100 beats per minute. And even an exercise such as a sit to stand is too strenuous and too provoking of the symptoms. So essentially, we can't progress them. We, we get very stuck with what we can do because exercise post-concussion, it's not about improving fitness or strength initially. It's about getting the autonomic nervous system to function correctly and therefore respond correctly to exercise, which then gives you the platform to then increase the, the intensity. But if you can't improve that autonomic system function, that baroreflex or that brain perfusion, then they're going to be stuck with a very low level exercise. So this is where I was thinking, okay, so BFR surely can play a really important role here because BFR is still low intensity or low load exercise. So it's if we compare it to high intensity training, like you, you know, the, the blood pressure heart rate response should be way lower. So we're still doing a low load exercise, but we've got the BFR. So therefore we're going to be able to you know, hopefully improve strength improve VO2, maintain muscle mass, prevent muscle protein breakdown or protein uh, uh, anabolic resistance uh, and overcome it if it already has started to kick, kick in. So what I do with my patients is cyclical endurance. So it's uh, so I, on the Delphi unit, I just, for the custom protocols, I just plugged in my own little protocol there. So riding on the bike, inflate for three minutes, deflate and reperfuse for three minutes, cycling throughout. So three rounds of each, and the heart rate is the target. So either 40 to 50% of their heart rate reserve or 80% of their symptom threshold. Whichever sits lower, I start them at the lower one. So as the, you know, the 80% determined by their results from the Buffalo concussion treadmill test. So the heart rate's the target. So while under occlusion, we want them to sit at that heart rate. So the exercise presser reflex will bring up the heart rate. So they'll be actually working at a lower rate compared to if they were under free flow. So if we're saying someone with BFR, someone without, we want you to hit 120 beats per minute, person under free flow, they're going to work a bit harder to get there. The occlusive stimulus will bring uh, stimulate exercise presser reflex, which will bring up the heart rate. So they're working, their work rate is quite low and we're ensuring we're not going over that symptom threshold heart rate. Then during the reperfusion phase, as we see the exercise pre presser reflex will drop off a bit. So we'll get a little bit more parasympathetic activity. I cue the patients to maintain their RPM. So whatever the RPM is while under occlusion, let's say they're at 86 RPM, that's the RPM when they're in the reperfusion phase as well, because reperfusion phase will drop off the exercise pressure reflex. We'll get some parasympathetic and the heart rate will decrease slightly. So if we say keep the heart rate the same, their work rate will just go up in reperfusion phase and then drop off when they're under occlusion, which I don't want that to happen because I want the heart rate to go up and to go down. So it's like an interval because by bringing it up, we're challenging sympathetic output. By bringing it down, we ch challenge the parasympathetic sy uh, nervous system to take reset vagal control over the vagus nerve, bring the heart rate down. So we're just manipulating what the autonomic nervous system does. If the heart rate remains the target for occlusion and reperfusion, then essentially we're just challenging it to stay the same. I want it going up and down because that makes it harder for it to function and also will hopefully bring it into line to function more appropriately uh, going forward with without BFR as well. Are you messing with LOPs to manipulate that at all or just kind of? No, I would leave it. I, I would start them at 60 if they're very symptomatic, but pro progress them up to 80% as soon as I can. Okay. Yeah. And bilateral. Yeah. Uh, you, yeah, bilateral or unilateral. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, and just swap it over and do but like 15 minutes on each leg. Okay. But if you can do bilateral, yeah. 
that's that, that's obviously easier if you're lucky enough to have multiple units. Yeah, we need to publish this protocol. That's yeah. beautiful. Yeah, and and the idea to progress is either increase the inflation cycle, so four minutes under occlusion, yeah. five minutes under occlusion, probably just leave the reperfusion still at three minutes, though. Okay. Seen any issues? No. So patients that come in that are quite symptomatic, they love doing this because they might get a little bit of spike in their symptoms under occlusion, which is okay. That's fine. We, you're allowed to uh, increase their symptoms as long as it's under that three points out of 10. But then under the uh, reperfusion phase, they feel a lot better because of blood pressure, the heart rate comes back down again. So they actually feel a lot better. But then also when you're under occlusion, you feel like you're working hard. Like you, that, those limbs yeah. are getting a workout. Oh, yeah. Again, as we said before, your activity can be so reduced post-concussion that you can not get that sense that you're actually doing anything to benefit your physical fitness or conditioning or strength. But by working low, low BFR, then you are challenging the nervous system to function. We're not triggering symptoms too much and you feel like you're actually doing something. So it's really good buy-in. Yeah. In yeah, I think of- that's a huge piece too. You know, they're so shut down. That was the thing too with our TBI guys. They're just like, Jesus Christ, I want to do something. You know, they're like telling me I need to be in a dark room and barely walk and all this sort of stuff. And so I, I think they're just dying to feel something. Well, that's it. Yeah. And, and a lot of patients, unfortunately, do get that poor advice. Stay in a dark room. Don't do anything, yeah. uh, which doesn't help their prognosis at all. Um, but yeah, absolutely. If we can get by and get, get patients feel like they're actually doing something while it's actually is doing something, improving their strength, hypertrophy, VO2, um, reduce, improving autonomic nervous system function, reducing exertional symptoms, then, then that's perfect. Two, three times a week? Uh, as possible, I guess, it, it, as much as your access allows. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of team people, they, they have unlimited access, you know, so I could hear them hit yeah. me up after this podcast, like, tell me how many times a week, how long. Okay. Yeah, I'd be doing two to three for sure. Okay. So in terms Definitely of the timeline, Adrian, I know, like I had kind of said, in, in my head, it's like maybe you're waiting to see this heart rate response sort of kind of come into line and sort of settle down and become sort of linear. But I almost kind of get the impression that maybe this might be something where if you are not seeing that happen, perhaps you kind of go the BFR route or, or maybe even you just jump into BFR earlier. Is that kind of how you're attacking it now or? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Like sometimes you might be waiting a while to see that linear response uh, and, and exercise should improve that. But if we can do BFR and yeah. do the cyclical version where it's like a reverse interval, we're challenging that heart rate. Like we're almost putting more demand on that system to actually do something with that heart rate. Yeah. 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 yeah it's just, a, I mean, you're giving it the same stimulus. You're just giving it in a different manner, um, yeah, maybe in a more different. controlled manner. Yeah. So. And, and, and even just using like passive BFR or, or IPC, yeah, that's my so, question. Yeah, yeah IPC, where, where does that play? So if we were, so some, some research shows that manipulating blood pressure, and that's either via medication or they say um, uh, inflating or deflating cuffs on a leg, so BFR, has a systemic response with regards to the barrow reflex. So we know when we, you do BFR, you know, on, on your lower limb, the reactive hyperemia in, index is challenging the blood vessels in the limb to accommodate that blood flow, maintain appropriate blood f- um, flow and pressure within the limb. But what it would seem is potentially is a, there's more of a systemic thing going on, whereas it's, it's actually challenging the baroreflex to improve or uh, deal with that cerebral blood. Deal with, yeah, deal with it, it. Yeah. 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 To hopefully improve it. So, my thoughts are, which I haven't tried yet, if there, we have some patients that are like too symptomatic even to come to me for any ass- assessment, let's try some IPC on them and see if yeah. after that they can exercise better. They, it, we're having some sort of an effect on that barrel reflex. It would be super cool to see that. In yeah. Play. Yeah, absolutely. And 
I, we, I do some resistance as well. It's again, it's cyclical. So it's the same 60 to 80%, 30, 15, 15, 15, 30 seconds. I just unplug uh, for the rest period and then hold my thumb over the hose so the pump just doesn't keep running on the unit. Yep. <laughs> we know that trick. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, so they, they do a strength exercise as well because if I initially, if you're just doing a strength exercise, they're going to be under occlusion for the whole time. They're about the six minutes. We might see that heart rate and blood pressure gets too high and they become too symptomatic. So give them the um, reperfusion on the rest. It, set, it does the same thing. Heart rate and blood pressure will come on while you're exercising. You'll actually get a rest on your rest um, phase. Heart rate, blood pressure will come down. So we shouldn't be provoking symptoms too, too much. But again, by lifting a very low load, we're going to improve their strength as well. So again, you get the buy-in. They feel like they're working. Super cool, man. What about prevention? Have you guys looked at anything, you know, to to go that route? From a prevention to concussion, yeah. I mean, what we're trying to, what we do, try and do with our patients for readiness to return to play. A lot of research shows it's about peripheral vision. So do some work with them with uh, the blaze pods and um, or the vision coach, which is like a screen you look at and you look at the center and you've got to touch all these dots that light up around it. If you can improve their peripheral vision um, and if they can see, let's say they are Aussie rules football player, NFL player, and, and probably NFL and rugby, um, more the sports where this would be more valid because um, – Australian rules football, like basketball, is a 360-degree de game. So there's people behind mm -hmm. you and beside you everywhere, whereas NFL and rugby, they're all in front. So if you see someone coming, you, you pick that up peripheral vision, you can actually contract the muscles in your neck to take that hit, to stabilise the head, to reduce that uh, the shake of the brain, essentially is what causes the concussion. It's when you can't see the hit um, that you might have issues if someone comes up from behind you obviously you don't know you're about to be tackled or take a hit so you don't contract those muscles therefore you get the big shake of the brain so a lot of the research says yes peripheral vision um, as well as neck strengthening but neck strengthening in isolation uh, it, it doesn't work unless you know there's a hit coming because you're by the time, if you see a hit coming, if you see a hit coming, by the time you contract yeah, your neck, too late. Yeah. you've already had the concussive force. So if someone hits you from behind, you don't know it's there. You haven't been able to contract your neck in time to stop that shake of the head. But if you can see it, you can anticipate. Yeah, I don't know, Kyle, we always see this at the booths of the conferences. They have the, the helmets where they're spinning the weight. Have you seen that? Mm -hmm. um, to, I don't know if that's that's anything at all, but yeah, it's supposed to strengthen them at 360 degrees to their neck. I tried it, I got dizzy, almost threw up. <laughs> so uh, I'm not sure if I can <laughs> do it. But yeah, there's stuff like that, that cue collar, you know, it puts a little stress on your carotids and increases yeah. intracranial pressure like the woodpecker. So there's all these kind of woo things out there right now, but I'm not sure if the evidence backs it up. So. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. There's obviously gonna be a lot of research in that field, but what it would seem is your neck can be as strong as you want it to be. But if someone hits you from behind, you can't Timing. strengthen yeah. that yeah. stiff neck yeah. in time. Yeah. 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 Well, man, this is badass stuff. Um, I'm just going to give your email to everyone that hits me up after this from the teams asking uh, the BFR protocols. You know, Duke has their concussion study and I don't know where it is. I haven't talked to him since COVID. Um, but you know, I, of anyone I've talked to that's actually doing BFR with concussion, you're one of the only people I know in the world right now that, that's really looking at it in a, in a scientific kind of manner. And these like radio protocols, I think it's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Cheers. Yeah. Well, I guess I just read all the evidence that was out there and thought about the way I actually treat concussion patients and then thought, okay, how can I combine this? So essentially it's all anecdotal based on my own thoughts, but uh, it seems to be working. Yeah. yeah, it seems to be working. Even though the first time you did BFR, the center for the intrepid, you almost died. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, 
Well, you, mm. we teach you the course uh, grade of exposure. <laughs> I didn't get any of that. <laughs> I, We're like, I, let's I mess got, with the Australian. Let's. <laughs> I got eighty percent occlusion on the top yeah. level of the total gym single leg. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. I like, do you, does it feel like, like do most people feel like they're gonna pass out? That'll ruin really? a weekend. Uh, I, I, I didn't feel that good. I felt a bit lightheaded. <laughs> 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 uh, my, mind you, I've done it millions of times on myself since then with yeah, no issues. Yeah. Okay, yeah, we were we were, oh, we were just yeah. picking, no, we were picking on them. <laughs> <laughs> we heard y'all were tougher. Adrian, man, <laughs> awesome. Awesome stuff, man. You're a great friend and uh, it, it's so good to talk to you. And by the way, you know, um, shameless plug, but you are our Owens Recovery Science instructor down under in Australia. And uh, mm-hmm. you got a course coming up down at Murdoch University in October. Um, and so if, if anyone in that area or, or anywhere around Australia wants to get to a course, I would highly recommend. Adrian knows this stuff backwards and forwards. I think he knows it better than we do half the time. Um, and especially if you have any TBI or concussive things, I think it'd be great to go pick this guy's ear. So mm-hmm. over at Brendan Scott's place, who does a ton of BFR research as well. So that's a one-two punch over there. So we appreciate your brother. Looking forward to it. Yeah. Let's get more Aussies through the courses. So we'll I know. Run a course every probably May, we'll be running a course out of the Epworth hospital where I work. And then probably every October, September, end of the year time, uh, we'll we'll be over in Western Australia in Perth. So anyone that wants to do it, stick to the Owens Recovery Science website. Yeah, we'll have them up there. Delphi got medical device clearance in Australia, so their devices are over there now. So if you take Adrian's course, Delphi can send you units if if you want to use theirs. But if anything, just take the course and and get educated through Mm. through this guy. Yeah. All right, man. Love to have more. All right. Well, any any final thoughts? You want to hear my Australian accent again? No, no thanks. No. Well, sorry. I think we already stopped recording. <laughs> I don't Jesus. know. I think your time uh, ran out. Uh, oh man. <laughs> oh, well, thank, right. Thanks for having me on, guys. I appreciate. Thanks for coming it. on, Adrian. That was thanks, fun. Adrian. Good to see you, man. You good. Good night. Good morning. Good evening. Whatever the hell it is over there. It's like two days morning. later than our time. Yeah. Good morning. All right, man. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Owens Recovery Science Podcast. Owens Recovery Science is a single source for PTs, OTs, ATCs, DCs, MDs, and other medical professionals seeking certification in personalized blood flow restriction rehabilitation training. Find them online at owensrecoveryscience.com.